Hi everyone. I have a, my name is Nalini Venkatasramani. Really long last name. Yeah. <laughs> People call me Professor V, V Star, whatever. <laughs> okay. Um, so I've been working in the area of distributed computing and middleware. For those of you who are unfamiliar with what middleware is, you know, think of anything that lies above a sim single device in an operating system to anything that lies below an application or a specific application context. So the management, the architecting, the orchestrating of resources in this highly diverse distributed setting is what we call distributed systems middleware. So the idea is can I design reusable mechanisms, code systems that can be used for a variety of applications that can execute on a variety of platforms. That's the idea. So, um, so I'll tell you a little bit about some of the recent work we've been doing. Uh, before I go on, I want to tell you that you know we've um, our team has been working with a large number of other universities and industry partners over the years. But one of the things that we are very um, proud about and I think unique in this context is that we work with a large number of government agencies, city governments, county governments, uh, fire departments, water departments, etc. And so a lot of the work that we do has the potential and has had a lot of impact in getting out into the community. And that's a lot of what I'll be talking about today, which is how do we take these distributed computing technologies and mechanisms and look at what are the challenges that arise in today's communities and today's, with today's technologies, and how can we actually make them apply and be useful in this kind of an application, in this kind of an environment context. Okay, so. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about these top few projects which talk about cyber physical systems, the Internet of Things, and smart communities today. But over the years, we've had um, you know, projects in several areas focusing on mobile and pervasive systems, um, adaptation as a fundamental mechanism for being able to deal with change in these large dynamic distributed systems, etc. Okay, so uh, feel free to come and chat with me about any of those projects. Okay? And interrupt if you feel like asking me a question. Okay. The talk is structured at a high level, so I can go into more technical detail into any of these parts uh, that you wish. So why are these cities and communities becoming interesting today? And why are we as computer scientists interested in it? What are the fundamental computer science problems that can be brought to bear in this context? And how do the new forms of cities and communities change how computer science in the future should be designed or mechanisms can be designed? The fact of the matter is that today, um, a, more than half of the global population is in cities. That number is expected to be about 75% in the, you know, by 2050. And so, you know, dealing with, when you actually look at what impact you can have dealing with, how you can take your technologies and put them into these cities and in the urban context makes a lot of sense. These communities, um, cities are made of various communities, and so large, small, just very wide, you know, very focused. Um, and these communities need a variety of services. Now, as computer scientists, we are used to thinking about services, service-oriented computing, you know, web services, and things like that. But, uh, but when you look at it from a community context, communities need services, which might be very functional. I need my water utility to work. I need power to work. Uh, despite you know small things that might be going wrong in the infrastructure, um, I need to have these operation of these basic lifelines: energy, transportation, water, my buildings, etc., working normally. Not only do I want them working, I also may have certain other what I would call non-functional um, requirements. I may need them to work reliably. I may need them to work securely. I may need them my privacy to be preserved in this context. I may need it to be cost effective. Um, um, and you know certain things I want information coming to me in time independent of where I am and so these different stakeholders in these communities which might be you me the average citizen the government agencies businesses etc need all of these requirements with at varying levels so some things you need more securely some things you need more reliably some things you might need securely and reliably so really what we are talking about is this distributed computing, large scale, distributed computing context in which you may need multiple of these elites to be working in concert with each other. Okay, so smart cities starting sort of at the grassroots begins with an individual who lives in a home, 
who lives in a larger, uh, was probably maybe part of a building, either at work or at home, and maybe part of a community or campus, and that's part of a city. So at each of these different levels, we have technologies <coughs> impacting us. These technologies, as I said, might be for providing us safety, for providing comfort. You know, if, uh, if I'm a senior citizen, I may have a pacemaker or I may have a heart rate monitor that tells me how well I'm doing, um, whether I am doing taking my medicines regularly, if I am a um, person who's driving on the freeway, I may need information about where in the roads things are congested, for example, etc. So I, we have projects at these different levels, and we have can we will go into how information systems and distributed systems and networks actually play a role at these different levels, and where can things go wrong. So today, this is becoming more and more important. You hear about smart this and smart that and smart city this, and there's all these efforts that are going on. Why is this the case? This is because we have these new technologies that are enabling us to satisfy those multiple needs that we talked about simultaneously and cost effectively. So most of you have heard about, again, IoT this and IoT that, Internet of Things, where every door, room, every bed, chair, bracelet, book, you know, table is being instrumented with some sort of a sensor or a device that will allow us to track where it goes, to figure out is it um, working okay, is it not working okay. That's our IoT revolution. And you have, if you go to the Bay Area, and some of you are from the Bay Area, there's lots of com companies that are burgeoning, trying to produce a new device or a new protocol. Or, you know, most of us are wearing some sort of a device on us today or carry these devices. The mobile revolution, we carry these things and we instrument these things and these things move around, whether they are cars, so every bike, car, bus, train, smartphone, smartwatch is mobile, it's not static and staying in one place. So dealing with this notion of mobility and being able to provide those services as you talk about, in this mobile context is becoming commonplace. I mean, we are, it, we are starting to expect it. There's all of these devices and both uh, from these Internet of Things, which are on static or on mobile entities, are generating lots and lots of data. We are figuring out where to put all of this information and we, how to process all of this information. And so today we hear about cloud computing and that has progressed in its own way. So almost every photograph, trip, document, message, transaction is somehow somewhere in some cloud platform, right? So and. This data, these devices are all used for a variety of societal scale mechanisms and applications. So you're really looking at your home, your community, your, um, your um, environment, essentially sitting in the cloud being accessible by you, perhaps by anyone else, anywhere, anytime. And these new systems that are coming about are good because they're giving us new capabilities. And But the interesting thing is that do they have are they independent? They're really not in an independent context. They are interdependent and perhaps interfering. So these new interactions that come up as a result of all of these different things being put together, sharing the same wireless network. Some of you might not be getting good Wi-Fi access because there may be too many people. When you go to a large conference, many, many times you see that, right? So these new interactions bring about new vulnerabilities. And that is what we call the internet of broken things. <laughs> right. So uh, a year or so ago, and this is, um, some of you might have heard of this uh, or seen this uh, Gartner, you know, Gartner group, which is, uh, they put out these predictions and they put out this, um, uh, these um, graphs, which they call the hype peak, and which says, here's new technologies, it's on its way up, oops, it's on its way down, and if you look at the top of the hype peak, what you have up there is the Internet of Things. So Internet of Things is becoming really popular, but why has it reached its high peak? And we got to go back and think about what is the problem that it might be causing. And one of there is obviously huge scalability issues. There's you know so many people manufacturing so many devices with all different types of, uh, of protocols interacting in this environment. Huge security and privacy issue that arises. But dependability is key. So if I'm putting something out there for a fundamental service and that service doesn't function the way I expect it to, then I have a problem. No dependability, no internet of things. And that's really where we have a fundamental issue. In a broader context, this notion of dependability can be characterized as resilience. So today there's lots of efforts by the National Institute of Standards, by several agencies, um, 
starting from the White House, looking at how can I build communities and cities that are resilient? And resilience can mean a lot of different things, but here's one specific uh, definition of resilience that comes from a presidential policy directive, which says, I need to be able to adapt to changing conditions in the environment and recover rapidly from disruptions. When they say disruptions here, they really mean large-scale disasters. They're talking about a Hurricane Sandy, they're talking about a Katrina, they're talking about the Haiti earthquake, they're talking about naturally occurring threats or incidents or perhaps deliberate attacks. And there's a number of these addressing this resilience in the presence of all of this change that we are seeing with these new devices and the IoT and the cloud and the mobile revolution is really an interesting context to sort of study a lot of problems in. You need these, um, I won't get into the details of this because I, you know, there are lots of different issues. There are aging infrastructures, there's a huge growth, there are new demands, um, there we have these new shocks, these natural, large, small, man-made shocks. And really what we really are worried about is are the current principles of designing these very large scale systems sufficient for this context to provide us with resilient communities of the future? So I'll start out step by step in different projects we have done over the years, starting from the home to you know, a building to a large campus, and many of these are ongoing. And the interesting, beautiful part of this is as technologies change, you, can, you revisit these contexts and then you find new problems that arise in these contexts. So, for example, um, I will, one of the things that happens as homes start getting instrumented, most of us have heard of a Nest device that's a thermostat that adjusts the temperature in your home based on you know, what you like it to be, what the current uh, environment is. But really, if you think about it, if I start putting a lot of different sensors in your home, why am I doing this? I'm doing this to make it a comfortable and secure place and safe place for you. Personalization is an important issue. Designing systems that are devoid of the human in this particular context makes no sense because this, a home, is inherently a human in the loop process, right? <laughs> a human is an integral part of a home. And it needs the needs that people have in terms of what they would like to be monitored, what services they like to get differ from person to person and over time. Uh, there are fundamental privacy expectations when I'm in a home. It's my home, you know, I don't like, I may have highly granular sensors. The, you know, these sensors that we instrument for these services often capture things that people often consider very private. So in um, uh, one, um, one of the, while comfort and cost and, uh, you know, is really part of the um, issue, privacy is a big issue as well. Here is one project that we were looking at, uh, we're starting to look at, in fact, we've instrumented a senior housing facility in Montgomery County where we're looking at instrumenting seniors, instrumenting the space with different types of sensors. You know, different types of tags which capture accelerometer, um, things on the rug, you know, under, underneath your floor, that pressure sensors that might capture when you fall down, and uh, etc. cetera. So, um, do you remember what I do here? I think I remember I do something here. No, click the top button again. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so that's an example of, and how do I do this reliably? Now, all of these sensors, uh, one of the things we worry about is this is an expensive process. Instrumenting the entire space with sensors, instrumenting people with sensors that work reliably. So I, one of the issues that we have with falls is you can't say, I'm going to detect when you, if you fall between three and five. <laughs> Okay, you got to be detecting falls all the time. If I have to have devices on me that are detecting falls all the time, they have to be battery powered all the time. It turns out that if I'm running a fall detection application on a mobile phone, it may last six hours or five hours, right? If I have a tag which consumes a little bit less energy and it's on a small battery, I have to change the battery every three or four days. Not a very convenient thing to do, especially if you have to have these perpetually running applications. So energy management and design of devices that are energy efficient while still providing accurate fall detection is an interesting topic and research area that we're working on. Moving from the home to a building, a different context, okay? So what, are, what do you do in a building? You do lots of things in a building, like this building. And I particularly talk about this building because we, this particular building is instrumented with a variety of sensors. Um, almost every entry and exit has um, audio-visual sensing, which is a, uh, one of the issues we study is 
how can I provide facilities while not encroaching on the privacy of the person who's in the space? Um, there's also other things. You know, we have electricity, we have temperature, HVAC control, lighting control, we have seismic safety. We have all of these different things that are part of a functioning operational building. And keeping that building functioning for either whether it's a lab, a lab has to be maintained at a different temperature versus, you know, if there's nobody in the space, can I do this in a sustainable manner and turn off the lights or reduce the expenditure for HVAC? So this is a new, um, building management systems have been built for a while. For example, in this building, we have a Siemens building management system. But one of the things we're bringing in is we're bringing in a whole new set of new building management sensors and devices that Honeywell is going to instrument this entire building for us. And the key issue that we are going to study in the space is this building is going to become an experimental test bed, is becoming an experimental test bed for how privacy can be preserved in smart spaces while providing different kinds of applications. Can you, as someone who walks into the building, specify your privacy preferences saying, you know, I don't mind people knowing that I'm in the building, but I don't want them tracking whenever I'm going to the bathroom and coming back. Can I provide this kind of concierge service to someone who's walking into the building in a accurate and reliable fashion? Okay. So this is one of the projects that we're doing. With the Honeywell has a, a building management infrastructure system that we're using for this purpose, and really an integration effort, which is where middleware plays a very interesting role. So going from the building, home, building, campus, um, we have this in infrastructure. This infrastructure that we have over here actually extends to about a third of the campus. It's a little old. Some of it works after we've been operating it for about eight years to ten years right now, and so things fail quite badly sometimes, you know, uh, stops working. It's called the urban, and so we are in the process of replenishing it, and this is great because we get a whole new bunches, new types of sensors and devices that we're instrumenting the space with. It's called the Irvine Sensorium. So what we've instrumented it, we've instrumented, and the purpose that we instrumented this for is primarily for the purpose of crisis response and emergency response. Three or four times a year, we don't do it as often now, but we run emergency drills. And we take our new networking protocols, our new types of devices, our new data management technologies, and infuse it into these drills so that we can test the impact of, so I can't go to the city of Los Angeles and say, hey, I have a new networking protocol, can you test it for me? And see how well it works on the port of Los Angeles, right? I have to have an ongoing facility and a test bed where I can continue testing these new technologies. What this kind of an instrumentation enables me to do is to create an evolving digital representation of a physical world upon which I can run different types of research. So I can look at, you know, I can make networks fail, I can make devices fail, and figure out how well my end-to-end -end service works when devices and networks fail. I can say I have three people, or you know, I have a group of people who don't want anyone to know where they are, but if there's a fire in the building, how do I still provide the right number of EMT, you know, emergency medical support to coming in? So can I design these tuning knobs for resilience and privacy in the context of this large, using this digital representation that I have of the physical world. So the key idea is these sensors allow us to observe some what's going on in the space at some level of accuracy. They allow us to analyze, and this may be pretty complex and error prone. The observation is error prone. The analysis can be error prone. You know, most of us who have done, um, who have worked on some sort of vision-based processing know that um, facial identification Right? If I have to say, aha, this is to my eye, and the camera in a random place has got to say that, it's not going to be accurate. Right? So there's inaccuracies, even if the infrastructure was perfect and the networks were working perfectly and the camera was pointing at your face perfectly, the analysis techniques may not be perfect. Once I can analyze, I can actually do adaptations in the space to improve security, safety, utility, etc. We have used this for a number of different uh, applications, such as surveillance and monitoring. One of the interesting applications we've used it for is, I'll give you an example of it, I'll jump. We've used it for a number of applications. Is the Sapphire system, which provides firefighters who are coming into the building with sort of an intelligent dashboard with, that comes out of the data that's collected from the sensors in the space. Okay, so the idea is we have different types of sensors in the space, temperature, humidity, ambient carbon monoxide, image, video, et cetera. We also have the firefighter instrumented with various sensors. And this was because the funding agency said, 
we're, we're interested in saving people in the building, but we're also interested in keeping our firefighters safe. And it turns out firefighters, usually a lot of them recently have died because they get heart attacks. Okay? They get heart attacks because they are in the throes of fighting the fire and they don't realize that their heart rate has gone very high. They are often exposed to blood carbon monoxide. Even if the ambient carbon monoxide is low, the car what they call the carboxyhemoglobin, the amount of carbon monoxide in the blood can get very high and that causes them to get disoriented. If you tell them there's an exit, they may not even realize how to get to it. And a lot of, so the idea is through this dashboard and an incident commander sitting outside in an SUV, okay? What that incident commander, the fire practice is essentially people go in in groups, the incident commander directs everyone. If I can give incident commanders information about, hey, this person is fine, but this person is, you know, heart rate is very high or blood carbon monoxide is high, the incident commander can direct the firefighter back to safety before they get into a critical situation. So these kinds of applications, obviously, uh, we used to run several drills. We used to have lots of firefighter forums uh, going on here. We still do. We work with them. So there's this new area that started called smart firefighting. And very exciting new topics of how GIS and you know, sensors and drones and other kinds of things can play into the space. So uh, a more recent project going again from building community campus to a large scale community. This is an example of a project again um, looking at uh, instrumenting, I mentioned it earlier, instrumenting a low-income senior housing complex with a variety of sensors and a variety of networking technologies. And the key idea here is cheap. You know, IoT and sensing and instrumentation is not necessarily for people who can afford to buy hundreds of devices. Shouldn't be. Or for people who have the technology wherewithal to manipulate and design the wireless infrastructure to do this. So really, this project, uh, which came out of NIST and the White House and has a whole bunch of partners, is essentially about democratizing IoT. And how can I make it effectively effective for the purpose of the citizen, you know, the senior sitting at home? Um, so, so we have instrumented these homes. And I'll show you. This is the scale project of smart community awareness and alerting. Sensors from here send data using a variety of technologies, Wi-Fi, something called ultra narrowband which is very low power, very low bandwidth, long range wireless sensor where if the power goes off, lots of our sensors are plugged into the wall. The power goes off, sensor is out. Okay, I can't detect falls. I mean, it wouldn't make sense to say, I can't detect falls if the power goes out in the building. You know, if you fall, sorry, can't help you. Right, in this case, ultra narrow band is really good because it gives you very, it gives you very small bits of information, but the battery can last for 10 years. 12 years. And it's long range wireless. It's not like I have to have it in every room or in every building even. So we have an ultra narrow band facility um, uh, base station sitting on top of the county office here, the county um, uh, executive office. Data goes from the building to the county office to an IoT based cloud run by IBM in this case for detecting is there a problem. If there's a problem, because my sensors are cheap, they don't work very well. So I've got to confirm. And if I, you know, I can't send the firefighters out to your building. Uh, to your home every time something goes wrong. So actually we use a third party phone service to call the resident back. The resident gets a phone call and the resident doesn't respond. We see maybe there is something wrong and information goes into the dispatch center dashboard and a fire truck is, depend uh, is uh, sent out. This whole sort of end-to-end -end loop has been tested and put out in Montgomery County using these cheap Raspberry Pi based sensors and devices that we got off the internet. So here's our little sensor box, which has a bunch of different sensors, seismic sensors, gas sensors, temperature, um, explosive gases is one of those we can motion detectors. So if you've not been moving in your house for a while, um, we detect that. The, so the hardware is one part of it. The software that we develop on it and the applications we develop on it is uh, actually very it can be complex and it's very extensible. So we have many sensors, many clients, starting from really cheap Android, Arduino, Raspberry Pis in this case, going down to uh, different um, to the cloud where analytics gets executed. <laughs> Two minutes, okay. All right. So uh, this project, we, we learned a lot of lessons in deploying this, and it was operational for a while. And so the original scale project, which had six partners, now grew to about 25 to 30 partners to learn all kinds of different things. And here are some lessons we learned from that scale experience. Devices don't work very well. Our gas sensors, after two months, 
you know, we take, well, the way we test them in our lab is we take a gas lighter and we put it close to the gas sensor and we say, hey, you should be detecting something. The kind of detection that happens after two to three months of continuous operation is not as good. So we have a reliability in the, you know, clear reliability. But the issue is because they're cheap, I can have lots of them. And I can have them triggered and operational and turned on in certain ways that they don't all degrade simultaneously, right? Uh, so there are problems with the devices. There may be issues with the networks because I have networks going out and if I'm in California and I have an earthquake and all my data is going to the cloud and my connectivity to the cloud is broken down, oops, right? So how do I continue this operation despite the fact that data may be going to the cloud and the connectivity to the cloud may be broken? We have run several tests here where you know somebody steps over one of our mesh networking wires and half the building is out of our virtual Wi-Fi. So you know, how do I operate in that kind of a setting? These applications that I put on top of these devices, they may crash, they may fall. So how do I keep this continually operating? And really what we are looking at is looking at resilient designing and building resilient middleware at the communications level, at the data exchange level, at the service execution level. And this is the scale two project. Um, as I said before, I, I won't dwell on this slide, but things can go wrong at the infrastructure level. Devices can fail, networks can get congested, but things can also happen at the information level. There can be uncertainty in information processing. There can be contextual errors. We had a firefighter once who had two light sensors on them. One of them said 1,000 lumens, the other one said zero. Which one do you believe? And the reason it did that was because he had a light sensor on, on him to measure visibility levels, and he was bending down. So it blocked out the light. So how, did we, how, how can we uh, solve this issue? There was another firefighter nearby who again said it was 800 lumens or whatever. So what you can't get in one sensor, you might be able to get in the masses. And so how do we exploit that is really the issue. So we have developed, oh, not again. Mm -hmm. Okay. Develop techniques to uh, exploit many resilience techniques. You know, standard mechanisms are how do I exploit redundancy? How do we exploit mobility? How can I exploit human input? And to give you a very, so in this particular case, I'm gonna pick one. Okay, let me, so we've looked at different layers of systems. At the edge, what we do is, if there is one path to the cloud that, what if I can create multiple resilient overlays, multiple paths to the cloud infrastructure, such that if one of these paths fails, I can quickly repurpose another one. Very useful in seismic sensing, because uh, you know, if um, the internet is inherently somewhat reliable, it allows you for adapt. It allows adaptive routing. So if I can somehow maintain multiple paths to cloud platforms, and I can use those things very effectively, then I might be able to route around failures in these kinds of large uh, if uh, errors or large faults. I can also do things at the edge. So one of the things we are exploiting is this notion of fog computing or edge computing. And today we have these new networking technologies called software-defined networking. Controllers and routers and switches that have special components that can be controlled and managed by software. Can we use these at the edge to be able to decide that if I can't send data to the, to the cloud, can I do more, somewhat better sense making at the edge? Rather than rely on the cloud to do something, what can I do at the edge? So for example, if my seismic sensor says, hey, there may be a problem, I'm gonna check my neighboring room, I'm gonna check my neighboring house, right? Can I do something in a local ad hoc mesh setting to be able to do that? We took these scale boxes, um, there are, so I will, I will skip these detailed slides, and oh, it doesn't want to skip, okay. And we also put it on a bike. So in a large community, you don't have sensors everywhere, right? So if I have sensors that cover certain areas and I can get sense making out of those areas, but I don't have it for certain other spaces. Can I go there to gather the information? So our, we call this the scale cycle platform. It's this multi-sensor box added on with the GPS, added on with some local storage, added on with a power battery pack. We're essentially, and put, the application we use it for is for air quality sensing. So we put it on a bike. We've driven it around Montgomery County, gone around um, actually the UCI campus. Uh, lots of interesting problems. Networking is not standard, so how can I decide where to collect, how much to collect, where to upload, 
given that different informations are of different size, priorities, deadlines, etc. So there's an interesting optimization problem and different types of heuristics and things that you can develop, just to give you an idea of the kinds of problems. Another interesting problem, if I have lots of mobile data collectors, you and I are willing to provide crowd sensing capabilities. Say, I'll put it on my bike. If I'm free, let me know. I'll go and collect the data for you. If I have k number of such mobile data collectors, can I give each of them a path such that I can collect the information I need as fast as I want? Can I do this path planning for mobile data collection? We've applied this kind, this particular problem to a shanty town fire setting in India. You know what shanty towns are? They are um, Here's an example of a shanty town in India called Dharavi. Pretty complex, and some of these roads are really, really narrow. They are pretty much like gutters. And so you can't really ride a car through them or a bike through them. You might have to walk through them. So we have people on bikes, people in cars. There's a, actually a freeway going through the center of the shanty town. And people just you know, on what we call um, you know, mopeds that are able to collect this data. But the question is, how do you tell them where to go? That's the problem. Okay, so there's very interesting uh, networking challenges. There's also very interesting information challenges, uh, sharing challenges, and we've developed a number of systems for emergencies and non-emergencies. Um, I think Ellie's telling me to stop right now. <laughs> but uh, we have a lot of very interesting applications. So bottom line I think I'd like to share with you is we have these next generation smart cities that are coming with you know, d d extended communication, transportation, etc. This requires us to think about systems which require a paradigm shift. And there's a whole bunch of challenges, computer science challenges, challenges that touch the community that require us, big data challenges, human in the loop challenges, information processing challenges, device design challenges that all remain to be addressed. Thank you very much, Nalini. Mm -hmm. Sorry.